Greed is, for lack of a better word, good. Gordon Gecko, Wall Street. Welcome to episode 010 of the SCP Foundation. Today, we're going to talk about my favorite group of interest, Marshall, Carter, and Dark, a group of interest which turns the anomalous into commercial products. As always, the majority of this podcast will contain my own opinions and thoughts on the SCP Foundation, the SCP Wiki, and the writing process. Regardless, remember that there is only one real rule in the SCP universe. There is no canon. Part 1. Scarcity The dinner show provided by Marshall Carter and Dark Limited had been surprisingly pedestrian that evening. The magician, though skilled and pretty, hadn't performed anything other than the usual misdirection, which could be seen anywhere. The hoop aerialist, who was also very pretty, and wearing a costume that left very little to the imagination, did little more than spin in her ring in various positions and look seductive. There was also little of what many considered the MCND flavor. The curtain closed around the stage as she finished her act and bowed. Polite applause sounded from the audience, along with a few barely audible, disappointed sighs. When the curtain reopened, the hoop had been replaced with a pair of white ribbon-like straps. A man built like a ballet dancer with bare arms and feet stood next to the straps, ready to perform. Music started playing. It was a peaceful melody, light and uplifting. The acrobat lifted himself onto the straps and started his act. At first, the act looked as though it was going to be as ordinary as the other performances. He wrapped the straps around himself, like the stripes on a candy cane. He hung himself upside down, spun himself in circles, and held himself parallel to the ground, while holding onto the straps solely with his hands. He contorted his body into grotesque shapes which could only be achieved with the help of the straps. He somersaulted upwards, spiraling the ribbons around his arms. The audience sat in silence throughout all these moves. The aerialist wrapped himself up asymmetrically. One strap spiraled down his leg, while the other wrapped tightly around his left bicep. There was a twist, a sudden drop, and a note of discord in the music. He was now hanging upside down from the one wrapped leg, while the other strap hung down, not wrapped around anything at all. His left hand was still gripping it, but his arm had been severed where the strap had been wrapped. There was no blood, and the aerialist continued to climb and twist himself on the straps unfazed. The arm climbed too, wrapping the strap around itself and alternating between gripping with the hand and the elbow. No wound on either end of the arm, only an expanse of white where bone, sinew, and other tissues should have been visible. The act now seemed to be a strange kind of partner acrobatics. A one-armed man and a single arm are both performing tricks. Sometimes the tricks were separate, and sometimes they were in tandem, resulting in holds and balances that should have been impossible. The arm helped him into another wrap. This one around both legs. The aerialist balanced himself like a board for a few seconds, while the severed arm held itself straight out above him. There was another twist, a discordant note in the music drop, and he again hung by one leg. His right leg had been severed this time, and joined the performance as a separate entity. Less than a minute later, his right arm joined the act. The music began to swell as the severed limbs, all moving on their own accord, helped the aerialist into position for what could be one final trick. His one remaining leg wrapped in a candy cane swell, as his severed arms wrapped the other strap around his neck, bringing him into a horizontal balance. One hand then brought the strap down and over his throat quickly, enclosing his neck. The body once again was hanging upside down, suspended through a wrap around the left leg. The head rolled on the floor. It was just as neatly severed as the other three limbs that were no longer attached to the suspended torso. His head finished rolling and faced the assemblage of wealth and power. The music still played, but the show was likely over. While the audience sat in stunned silence, the magician from earlier entered the stage. She looked at the hanging body, the severed limbs, and the head. Her expression, rather than horrified, seemed bemused. She glared at the aerialist's severed head, which returned her expression with a sheepish smile. Shaking her head, she started collecting his parts, one by one. 
Luigi reattached them to his body, wrapping a section of the strap around each one. He moved each reattached part into his suspension, keeping himself aloft with his strength until he was once again whole. Finally, he rolled down the straps to the ground, stood up with the magician, and bowed. And the audience applauded thunderously. A circus for mc and Limited, a terror unknown. The rich have always had exclusive clubs. We like to imagine the rich men of the past with giant handlebar mustaches sitting in private rooms and smoking cigars. It's a visual that most people familiar with Western culture can identify immediately. But what goes on in those private rooms? Well, in the world of anomalies, you end up with Marshall Carter and Dark. Ostensibly an auction house, Marshall Carter and Dark appear to simply move anomalous items from creators to collectors, but they actually do much more than that. They're fixers, cleaners, they're middlemen. The rich have significant limitations with regards to what money can buy. And MC&D is in the business of proving that not only can you buy happiness, but that they can quantify it and upsell you for the premium brand. Outside of the wiki, MC&D reminds me of an entity written by Joss Whedon on the television show Angel. In that show, there was a law firm called Wolfram and Hart. And Wolfram and Hart is another look at how businesses would operate in a world with supernatural elements. Welcome to the Los Angeles branch of Wolfram and Hart, the oldest and most powerful law firm in the city. Founded in 1791 on ground deconsecrated by the blood of mass murderer Matthias Pavain, Wolfram and Hart has put roots down in this glamorous city that grow deep, and branches that reach right into the heart of every major corporation, including Yoyodyne, Weyland Yutani, and News Corp. That captain of industry, we own his soul. That fabulous movie queen, she owes us her firstborn. Obviously, Wolfram and Hart is a bit further on the side of evil, while MC&D remains firmly in the neutral center of the alignment axis, right alongside the foundation. MC&D will always do what is best for their profit margins, and that means the preservation of the veil and ensuring humanity survives. But it also means that individuals are treated as human resources in the most literal sense of the word. Ultimately, when writing MC&D, you need to think about how people would act in a setting where profit is the primary motive. And how do you think people would act if there was a world where every sci-fi and fantasy trope were true and they could buy it for themselves? How would the company that sells those products act? And if you're trying to find the story there, you don't have to look very far. If you're trying to find the story there, you don't have to look very far. From customers to employees to how they interact with the foundation and other groups of interest, the possibilities are endless. Part 2. Mickey D's Why do rich people care about making money? The poor certainly need to care about doing so. When one's resources are only enough to scrape by, money is all that matters. It is important for the middle class as well. I mean, looking at their spouses, their children, there's a culture of dependence that weights them down. The rich want to make money because they can always become richer. There's always another echelon of wealth to rise above, some degree of opulence that is beyond their grasp. They drive to even further heights, seeking to slake their thirst for coin. They care about making money simply because they can. To do so, the rich exploit people far below them on the social ladder. The poorest of the poor, to the oil magnate, to the harshest dictator, to the kings and queens and lords and ladies, the common people are specks of dirt. And to Marshall, Carter, and Dark, the rich are unto ants. People, regardless of social standing, are all the same. The poor may spend their savings on worthless yet treasured trinkets sold by the middle class. The salary man may splurge on a pretty ring for his wife, the profits of which go into the pockets of a wealthy mining boss. In the same way, the gullible rich will burn millions of dollars on a single impossible object. Everyone is willing to waste their precious, precious money on something out of the ordinary. But value is artificial. The poor spend their pennies on mass-produced china, convinced that it has some worth to it. The rich convince the middle class that diamonds are rare and valuable, despite the stones being retrieved in Africa by the billion. Marshall Carter and Dark convince the rich that the impossible is value, while any an artist on the street can twist a die into a hypercube. The methodology of such a scheme is quite simple. 
but the critical step is to gain a market monopoly. If you're the only seller in town, you can set the price at any level you desire, so long as you drum up demand. In this regard, Marshall, Carter, and Dark have the advantage for hundreds of years. They were the only peddlers of anomalous wares in the world. They had the time to gain the capital, and with that capital, they can now outprice even the most competitive upstart. Organizations such as the Foundation, the GOC, and the Horizon Initiative resent the company's existence. They are unable to deal with such an unassailable economic powerhouse. With a glance, Marshall, Carter, and Dark could level a city, bankrupt a country. With a single call, they could plunge the planet into a thermonuclear war. Yet, to the eternal relief of all, they're the least volatile players in the anomalous field, after all. If the veil of secrecy were to break, the trinkets would become worthless, and their business would crumble and dissolve. For Marshall, Carter, and Dark, the planet is an intricate network they have secured safely beneath their thumb, where winning and losing are meaningless terms. There's no need to move pieces, and you can move the board. When you can end the match at any time, there's only one reason to continue. It's all about playing the game. Excerpt from the Marshall, Carter, and Dark Hub by Randomini. The earliest article I could find on the site that mentions Marshall, Carter, and Dark is SCP-138-ARC from 2008, which is currently rated at negative 49. Now this piece mentions an MCND Christmas charity auction in which an amulet that creates clones based around emotions was sold. This amulet shows up in a tale a half a year later called Perfection. This tale really serves to outline the niche that MCND occupies in the anomalous world, high society, and services for the rich and famous. Now, of course, this is reinforced by the next oldest MCND article, SCP-604, which is likely most people's first real read involving MCND. It is a set of tableware and dishes that creates human flesh out of non-human flesh. On the one hand, this reinforces the earlier tropes of high society and even immorality, especially in the last test where a human head is created that thinks and feels and talks. But it also betrays a hint of, excuse the pun, humanity in their process. See, these rich people want to experience the taste of human flesh without having to actually kill a human being. And if they were just straight up into cannibalism, they could, with their resources, probably acquire a human to eat. But they want to retain their morality while doing so, and that requires an anomalous solution. And MCND is eager to please. Ultimately, MCND remains somewhat static in portrayal until around 2014, with the creation of the MCND Hub by Randomini, which helped both flesh out the group, solidify some of the baseline lore involving them, and perhaps most importantly, outline their group of interest document format. And following the creation of the hub, there was a flurry of activity and portrayal of the GOI on the wiki. Most important amongst these was three tales by Kate McTierris set in the Gulf canon, and two tales by Dr. Clef for the Resurrection canon. Now these articles actually all follow a general adherence to a concept of limited cooperation between MCND and the Foundation. And prior to this, the two were never really in direct opposition to each other. And certainly, the Foundation and MCND had opposing secondary goals. But their primary goals of preserving the veil and postponing the end of the world were the same. While, of course, the Foundation was portrayed with a more altruistic intent, the fact that MCND was willing to save the world because dead people can't be customers doesn't change the alignment of their goals. But in Kate McTerris's stories in the Greater Gulf Canon, this was literally codified. The Southern United States Extranormal Organization Cooperation Treaty, or SUSUCT for short, was an agreement by the Foundation, MCND, and its Southern affiliates, and the UIU, not to interfere with each other's active operations as long as they qualify under the treaty. And the idea that the Foundation would sign such an agreement would have been unthinkable in the late 2000s, but in 2014, after the creation of the MCND hub, room for these kinds of stories had grown. In the Resurrection storyline, someone released a zombie virus on an MCND summer camp, and the Foundation gets called in to help suppress the outbreak. And MCND are more than willing to work with the Foundation to find out who did this and make sure that that person is punished. 
As a writer, I have personally latched onto these concepts with six different tales, GOI documents, and SCPs written since then that fully embrace either the gulf or resurrection canon interpretations of MC and D. Of course, sometimes MC and D is still just an organization the Foundation steals items from. But today, at least, the more involved they are in the narrative of the piece, the more likely they are to be begrudging allies of the Foundation. Part 3. Recommended Reading Welcome to Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited. If you're here, and you have been accepted into our ranks, congratulations. A short summary of our organization is in order. We are a club of sorts, and we provide our members with the most exclusive, expensive, and rare experiences available. We are centered in London, with agents all over the world finding and retrieving items for us so we may better provide such experiences. Now, those of you who are here today, sitting blindfolded in the audience, are to be our finders, our retrievers. We have selected you from the best of the best, the most able and intelligence of all who have applied. Allow me to explain your duties. You are to be our field agents. Many of you have connections to other groups that deal with objects that we are interested in, such as the Foundation, the Serpent's Hand, and the Church of the Broken God. We expect full loyalty to our cause, despite these connections. Any sign of deviance will be punished. As you will work on a case-by-case -case basis, I will be very broad. Cases, known as acquisitions, will be assigned based on personal statistics. You are not allowed to turn down an acquisition. While working on an acquisition, you will have access to a certain portions of our near-unlimited resources, depending on the case. Abuse of these resources will be punished. You are to apply yourself to the assigned acquisition with all due haste while keeping up any required appearances. Under no circumstances are you to reveal that you are working for Marshall Carter and Dark. Any attempt to speak about Marshall Carter and Dark with people that have not been sanctioned by Marshall Carter and Dark will be punished. This concludes your orientation. Please face to the right and take short measured steps. Your blindfolds will be removed as you exit the door. Some of you will receive your first acquisitions case. Thank you for your time. Excerpt from MCND Agent Orientation by Book Wizard. So now that you've had a little bit of a look at MCND, let's talk about some articles you can read to get a better sense of what this group of interest is really about. Now these are going to be collated by my own personal knowledge, so there's going to be some bias towards the things I like. Links to all of this will be in the YouTube video description, and all wiki works mentioned here are licensed Creative Commons 3.0 share alike attribution. Operation Cannery Row, document 2013-451A3, I, double E, and Seven Vignettes from the Life of Mackenzie Lee Crook. All three are by Kate McTierris and quite worthwhile reads if you'd like a better understanding of MCND in the Gulf Canon, and specifically, the Susacht. Operation Camp Granada, and we've got a good thing going here, by Dr. Clef, for a better look at how MCND is portrayed in the Resurrection canon. Rogue AI and Brian Brayer Brand Pocket Vacations by me, Dr. Sumerian, for a look at how an MCND document is formatted on the wiki, and also some fun stories. And I want a fun look at the internal workings of MCND. Check out Mickey D's by Dr. Chandra. Part 4 Credits. My name is Christopher Clayton Morris, although you may know me better under the pseudonym Dr. Sumerian. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution Share Alike Unported License. All works from the SCP Wiki used or referenced in this podcast are under a Creative Commons 3.0 Attribution Share Alike Unported License, including the following works. A Circus for MCND Limited by Terra Unknown. SCP 138 ARC, originally posted to the wiki by Far2. Perfection by Dr. Gears. SCP 604 by Name. Yes, that is correct. Name. MCND Hub by Randomini. The Gulf Hub by Kate McTierris. The Resurrection Hub by The Deadly Moose. And MCND Agent Orientation by Book Wizard. This podcast utilized a clip of audio from Season 5, Episode 9 of the television series Angel under the principles of fair use through commentary. This podcast includes the following audio works under a variety of licenses. A Human Being by Andy G. Cohen, 
off the 2016 album Through the Lens, licensed Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution. So Low by Art of Escapism in 2017, licensed Creative Commons 4.0 Share Alike Attribution. Wall by Jazar off the 2017 album Super, licensed Creative Commons 4.0 Share Alike Attribution. Latinum by Drake Stafford in 2017, Licensed Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution. You are currently listening to Everyone is So Alive by Loyalty Freak Music off the 2017 album Robot Dance. It is a public domain work. Thanks for listening. You want to know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass balls to sell real estate. Go and do likewise, gents. Go and do likewise. Blake from Glengarry Glen Ross.